I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Grandma's Sasquatch Grandma moved to Washington State in 1959. Gram, as I called her, and her little dog Timmy took up housekeeping in a cozy little house in the country. She was surrounded by woods and close to a river. It was that very first summer. That was about the time things came up missing, she said. The first thing she noticed was the missing blanket. Stolen right off my clothesline. The next week, it was two blankets. She stopped leaving them out at night after that. They never took my clothes, not even one pair of undies, thank goodness. It was just the blankets they were after. Graham had a huge vegetable garden and grew perfect and colorful foods. Tomatoes, potatoes, carrots, green beans, lettuce, cabbage, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, raspberries, strawberries, and other vegetables as well. There was even a grape arbor under which she had a picnic table and chairs. Shortly after the blankets came up missing, she began to notice fruits and vegetables missing from the garden. Of course, there were problems with the occasional deer, raccoons, and a rabbit or two, but this was different. The vegetables, such as the tomatoes, appeared to have been neatly plucked from their vines, and whole squashes and zucchinis came up missing. Now, if deer or rabbit were to eat from a squash, they would nibble at it or eat a hole out of it. Whoever or whatever this was picked and took the whole squash, and Graham's squashes grew huge and heavy. One day while working in the garden, she noticed tracks in the soft dirt around the potato patch. As she took a closer look, she saw they were not deer tracks, they were not raccoon prints, nor were they claw prints like a bear would leave. In fact, these were not any kind of paw, claw, or hoof prints. They had five toes. These were footprints, huge footprints. She thought to herself, if this is one of the locals, they sure have some big feet. She estimated the prints to be about 18 inches long. That evening, when darkness fell, she pulled her favorite chair up to the window, and with Timmy on her lap, she sat in the dark and waited. Around midnight, she heard a howl, a loud howl like nothing she had ever heard before. Timmy shook and whined. It was not a coyote, she knew that, and it was not a cougar. She heard it repeat several times, then the howling was followed by several hoots, she used to perform these hoots for me. Whoop, whoop, she would go. The howling she was never able to imitate. She never saw anything that night, just heard the sounds of something very strange. The next night she was too tired to stay up, so she slept with one ear alert and never heard a thing. The third night she left a giant squash, two tomatoes and a basket of string beans outside on a picnic table, and she stayed up again, watching out her window this time with the rifle standing next to her. And this night, she wasn't disappointed. As Graham sat with Timmy in the dark, she found herself lost in thoughts of the past. Suddenly, Timmy's head jerked, and his little ears stood alert as he began to tremble. Off her lap he jumped, running straight under the bed. Graham never heard a thing, even though her window was open a crack. She stood, looked out toward her garden, and there standing in front of her raspberry bush was a huge creature. A dark brown, hairy beast is how she described it, at least eight feet tall. He would have to duck just to come inside the house. She watched as it ate the berries, grabbing handfuls and shoving them into its mouth. I thought it was a big gorilla escaped from the zoo or the circus, but I knew it wasn't. This was no gorilla. When finished with the berries, he wandered over to the tomatoes, and she watched him very gently pluck one hold it up to inspect it, then shove the whole thing into its mouth. He then took the squash from the picnic table, and with giant strides and one arm swinging, he walked away into the woods. She used to imitate his walk for me, and I would laugh, her walk being very similar to Groucho Marx. She would say, I'm not being funny, that's how he walks. I asked her once what she felt that first night, and mentioned that she must have been terrified. Her answer was, I just thought, why did he pluck a tomato off the vine when there are two perfectly good ones on the table, and all he took was the squash? Graham wasn't one to be afraid of much of anything. She was the one you could depend on to save you from the big spider or the one to take her shoe, if not her hand, and smash the cockroach. 
I remember once as a young child living in California, we had a man try to break into our house through a narrow bathroom window. Graham was so mad, she grabbed a huge butcher knife on her way outside. The man was halfway through the window. She pulled him back out by his ankles and chased him all the way up the alley. We never saw him again. She never waited up for the creature again. From that day forward, she would leave something on the picnic table for him. He's some unfortunate creature who's just hungry, that's all. And I share and share alike. She said he only came in the summer and fall months, and he came year after year. She found that he preferred the squash and pumpkins, so that very next summer she began to make cakes out of his favorite vegetables to leave on the table for him. About once a week she would bake him one in a bundt cake pan. She said he is such a big guy and his hands were so huge that he could pick the cake up by the hole in the center and eat it like a donut. He must have loved those cakes because soon after he began to leave her little tokens of appreciation on the picnic table. There would be an apple, a pine cone, a flower, or a pretty rock. She kept those gifts on the windowsill in her kitchen. I remember an apple he once left for her, which had a huge wormhole in it. She showed it to me and said, Look, there's a fat worm living in this apple. I don't think he cares and eats the worm at all. It seems to me that apple sat up on the windowsill for a very long time. I've never seen an apple last so long. Every summer, she would also leave a blanket out on the clothesline, but it was never taken. Nor was the garden ever raided again. Only the cake and fruit and vegetables left on the table were ever taken after that. Even the baskets that held the food were left. She didn't have a name for her creature. She would sometimes call him the Beast. After a while, she began to call him King Kong, and that name stuck. It wasn't until the early 1970s that she found another name for her creature. There were a series of sightings, and it was all over the news. Bigfoot, he was called, also known as Sasquatch by the Indians. She couldn't pronounce Sasquatch, so she continued to call him King Kong, and only occasionally the Bigfoot. I had an encounter on my Bellingham property back in 1976. I never saw him, but I heard and smelled him, and he made a mess of my garage. A half hour after leaving my property... Two security guards and two police officers chased a Bigfoot into the woods at the small airport near my home. It was all over the news the following morning, so I knew for sure what was at my place that night. Graham said, well, you should have baked him a cake. Graham never mentioned a smell. She did occasionally mention hearing the howls and hoots in the summertime. I never heard or saw anything when I stayed at her place. It's almost like he knew she had company. Back in the year 2000, I did hear howls and shrieks myself while living at another country home near Granite Falls, Washington. Eerie, to say the least. My wonderful, loving, caring, and sharing Graham passed away in November of 1989. Before she passed, she gave me her Sasquatch cake recipe, and the very same one she made especially for him and them, as she came to believe he was not alone and may have had a family. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.